Have you ever thought to yourself, why on earth do we trust Paimon? I mean, this question is in of itself ridiculous. Of course you did. In fact, I would wager the vast majority of players in Genshin Impact have already, at least at some point in time, questioned the intentions of this obnoxious floating bundle of gluttony and cringe. Realistically, it is preposterous of me to even consider otherwise. Just consider this. Isn't it weird that the Traveler, who as far as we know is an alien to Teyvat, fought the sustainer of heavenly principles during the fall of Conria, then ended up falling into a slumber 500 years later only to wake up at the perfect opportunity to fish out this one and only fairy from the sea. Such a strange coincidence. Also, don't you think that Paimon is, you know, lucky? Even perhaps a little bit too lucky, if I might add. Coincidentally, she always finds herself in the most dangerous situations and every single time, she always gets out completely and utterly unscathed. Ignoring the widespread acceptance of Paimon and Teyvat and the absence of curiosity about her origins, it's worth noting that in the Traveler's uh, dangerous encounters, enemies consistently overlook or actively avoid Paimon during battle. Now, the obvious answer for as to why Paimon gets ignored during the Traveler's battles is because, well, she's useless. Paimon is incredibly weak and practically poses no danger whatsoever, so why would anyone heed her attention or waste their time and energy trying to get rid of her when they need to focus on fighting a godlike being such as the Traveler? It's just a coincidence. Paimon gets lucky and the Traveler saves the day as always. But here's the problem. It is true that Paimon is irrelevant compared to the Traveler, yet despite that, when you look at the sheer scale and magnitude of the battles in which the Traveler participates, along with the destructive power of their enemies, someone as weak and fragile as Paimon should basically die from the collateral damage that takes place around the battlefield. And even then, even if we say that Paimon consistently survives being blown up to pieces by gods fighting and destroying the environment, it legitimately cannot be a coincidence whatsoever that the Raiden Shogun, for absolutely no apparent reason at all, decides to move Paimon out of harm's way before attempting to kill the Traveler. Even though, once again, this was completely unnecessary, the Raiden puppet could have simply sliced the Traveler and Paimon while at it. Beelzebul already did this with Kozano and Orobashi before, killing both of them with the same strike. Which is why I tell you it legitimately cannot be a coincidence that Paimon is always so lucky. In fact, this is not a coincidence. This is not luck. This is all destiny. And Destiny is a perfect segue for the rest of this video, because this is going to be the third and final video of the Elements of Teyvat trilogy. Now, this video will basically serve as a means for me to tie everything together and hopefully fill any missing gaps from the previous two. I also plan to share a number of really interesting and fun ideas that I did not really get the chance to talk about before, so let's not waste time and dive straight into it. To start things off, we are going to have to talk about the Watchers of Teyvat. <laughs> get it? That's, that's why I said dive straight into it, <laughs> because we are going to talk about the waters, get it? Dive waters? Uh, okay, never mind. Uh, okay. But seriously, there is something messed up with the waters in Tevat. And even though I spent the entirety of the previous video discussing Fontaine and its waterline crisis, I still have a lot to share when it comes to Tevat's struggle with the seas. Now, an excellent starting point would be, well, the name Teyvat in of itself. You see, the word Teyvat, which is the name of the continent where the vast majority of Genshin Impact's story takes place, comes from the Hebrew word that means Ark. Historically speaking, an Ark is a massive vessel that provides protection against extinction. And here I need you to pay attention in particular to the word extinction, because we are talking about a very particular method of extinction here. However, before I expand on this topic, we are going to have to establish common grounds on a fundamental reality around the nations of Genshin Impact. So to make sure we are all on the same page here, as you know, the nations of Teyvat are all directly inspired by countries on Earth. Mondstadt's primary counterpart is Germany, along with a little bit of the United Kingdom. Inazuma's counterpart is Japan. Liwe's counterpart is... God damn it, man. Whichever version of China you choose to recognize, honestly, this is such a complicated topic and the fact that the PRC keeps claiming random garbage on the map despite already having countless border disputes does not help. Look, I kid you not, I could make a two hour long documentary talking about all of the history surrounding what China really looks like and that would still not even remotely do the topic justice. Especially right now, over here, you see this place, the South China Sea? There is so much bullshit happening around here that even countries such as Saudi Arabia and Iran are directly involved. So to keep things simple for the sake of this video, let us just say that Liwe is roughly inspired by this portion of China over here, roughly. 
And because I know for a fact that the Reddit baboons are already typing their garbage about how I'm erasing Chinese identity while they themselves don't know jack shit about the history that led to the map we see today, shut the fuck up, you absolute lobotomite, and go back to arguing with other losers on Twitter. There is so much history and cultural diversity pertaining to this topic that it is incredibly difficult to actually form an image of what China should look like. Even Chinese people themselves disagree on what the real China looks like. Just a few weeks ago, the CCP was claiming parts of Mongolia. It just doesn't make sense. Anyway, let's just get back to Genshin. Fontaine is France and Italy, Snezhnaya is Russia and most likely a few other Slavic and or former Soviet countries. Sumeru is, uh, um, well, all of this. Natlan will most likely be uh, all of this, and uh, you know what, throw in Portugal and Spain for good measure. Uh, Conria's counterpart are the Scandinavian countries. And finally, this leaves us with Celestia, which is almost definitely directly inspired by Israel, Lebanon, and Jordan. And those three can be simplified and referred to as the Roman province of Judea, for the sake of this video. And the floating city of Celestia in particular is probably a reference to Jerusalem. New Jerusalem, might I add. Now, since Celestia is based on Israel and the Kingdom of Heaven, we can be certain that their continent, Tevat, is referring to Noah's Ark which is a story in the Genesis of the Bible that tells of a universal flood that destroys the world. Extremely similar stories can be found in Mesopotamian mythology with the Babylonian flood hero Utnapishtim, who also constructed a massive ark to save humanity from extinction. Now, I will give you an extremely brief summary of both stories, and I need to emphasize that this will be a very brief summary. So, the first story goes as follows. On one sunny day, Gilgamesh, the Babylonian king of Uruk, meets with the immortal Sumerian king of Shurupak, Utnapishtim, to inquire him about the secret of immortality. Utnapishtim then proceeds to tell Gilgamesh how long ago Enlil, the god of the atmosphere, along with Anu, Ninurta, Ea, and Inugi, saw that humanity got too arrogant and thus decided to flood the world and destroy humanity. However, Ea, the god of water, took pity upon Utnapishtim and informed him of what would happen, then instructed him to build a boat that would carry him along with his family and every treasure on earth and the seed of all living things things, which means a male and female pair of every living creature. Utnapishtim does as he is told, and the gods send out a terrifying storm, one that is so scary that in fact the gods themselves tremble at the flood's power. Thus, they lament, lament what they have done and cry at the sight of their creation's destruction. Within seven days, all life is wiped out and the storm disperses. Utnapishtim's ark lands on Mount Nimush, where he sends out three birds, a dove, a swallow, and a raven to find land. The dove and the swallow return, indicating that they found nowhere to perch. But the raven does not, which confirms to Utnapishtim that there is a safe place to move forward. Later on, Enlil, who has severely regretted what he had done, looks upon the flooded earth and to his surprise he finds out that Utnapishtim and his family, along with the craftsmen of the Ark, have survived. So Enlil confronts Utnapishtim and he's like, sorry bro, MB. To which Utnapishtim replies, nah fam, we cool, trust and then offers him a sacrifice. So Enlil consults Ea and then decides to make Utnapishtim immortal and decides that he would never flood the earth again. Moving on to the biblical Genesis tale. Approximately 10 generations after Adam and Eve, God looks upon the earth and sees the wickedness of man had run rampant upon the lands which he had created, and that every imagination of their thoughts was full of corruption and evil. Angered and saddened by what had become of his creation, God decides to eradicate humans, stating, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. God, however, decides to inform Noah of what he will do and instructs him to build a great ship to house a pair of every living being on earth. Noah does as he is told, and within a span of 40 days, a great flood destroys the world and only Noah and his wife, along with their three sons and their wives, survive. Eventually, there are clans on Mount Ararat, the tallest peak in Turkey. Noah then sends a dove to look for land, and when they find it, the survivors celebrate by offering a sacrifice to God. After witnessing the aftermath, God feels relieved for Noah's survival, but also feels sorry for what he had done. So he tells Noah, sorry bro, MB. To which Noah replies, now fam, we cool, trust. So God establishes a covenant with Noah, promising him that his bloodline will repopulate the earth and that God will never flood it again. So as you can see, both stories of Noah and Utnapishtim are extremely similar with minor variations. They can both be boiled down to humanity becomes corrupt, the supreme divinity decides to destroy humanity with a great flood, a few survivors chosen by divinity create an ark to preserve life, a great mountain and birds, mainly doves and ravens, are involved, and divinity regrets what they had done and decides to reward the survivors and swear to never flood the world again. And what's crazy is that these flooding myths 
are not exclusive to Mesopotamia and the Abrahamic religions. They can be found all over the world, and the core components I just mentioned are usually always conserved in each myth, which is fascinating. But once again, for the sake of this video, because we are talking about Genshin's core universe, we are primarily interested in Gnosticism, Christianity, Mesopotamian mythology, along with the legend of Saha, which I discussed in my two previous videos on the topic, and a little bit of Chinese philosophy, but I'll talk about that in a different video. And here I need to correct an assumption which I've been trying to build up towards during the two previous videos. You see, I initially took the translation of Tevet to the Hebrew word Ark literally. In fact, I took it too literally. Now, take everything I just told you into consideration, and then remember that everything outside of Tevet is known as the Dark Sea. And I ended up with the incorrect assumption that Tevet's structure is that of an Ark. Not a continent on a planet, but quite legitimately a ship floating on the Sea of Quanta. Which, in this case, would be the abyss of Genshin Impact. Think about it as something extremely similar to the Sienjo Lofu from Honkai Star Rail. Just a giant ship that carries an entire world inside it. So, um, after all that, I'm sure that you can imagine my reaction when I met Nouvelle and he told me this. There used to be a special sea on the surface of this planet. The nature of its seawater was rather different from that of the sea we know today. There used to be a special sea on the surface of this planet. On the surface of this planet. Of this planet. As you can see, Nouvelle confirms a crucial piece of information. The continent of Devat sits on a planet, and make no mistake, this is a very good confirmation, because it gives us a definitive and solid idea of what to expect from the world of Genshin Impact, since now we know that it is a planet. And that obviously does not disprove any of the things I discussed before in the previous two videos. The only downside is that it confirms my theory on Tevat being a literal arc is incorrect, which, like, it doesn't matter. I never talked about it before, I was going to discuss it in this video, but we now know that Tevat is a planet, so yeah, whatever. In fact, I like the confirmation of the planet structure because that opens up the possibilities for many more interesting theories and ideas in the future. But now, let us return to the main topic, the waters of Tevat. What's wrong with them? You see, a major factor in the Biblical and Mesopotamian stories I just told you is water. And that makes a lot of sense, because during the dawn of civilization, the earliest humans would establish settlements around rivers and near seas where access to water, which is vital for life, would be easy, and these seas and rivers, well, they would often flood, especially during the winter and spring seasons. Here, it is important to recognize that the concepts of primordial waters from which all life emerged is fundamentally rooted in so many religions throughout history and across the world. And if waters have the power to be the source of life and its sustenance, then it stands to reason that waters also have the power to end said life. You can see this demonstrated all over Tevat, with so many of its ancient past buried deep beneath the oceans and seas. Aside from the examples I already mentioned with Fontaine, I need to take you back to Boer and Morax, both of whom make it very clear that they despise the deep sea and think that its creatures are weird and disgusting. And as I said before in my previous video, these two gods in particular having such a stance on the deep sea is incredibly interesting because Boer is the avatar of Hermansul, which should have access to all knowledge on Tevat. Yet despite that, one of the reasons Nahida hates the deep sea is because she does not understand it. And even if Boer does not understand the deep sea because her current incarnation, Kusanali, is still relatively young at 500 years old, you must remember that fear and by extension hatred are deeply rooted feelings which very likely extend all the way back to Boer's previous incarnation, Rukadevata. And the other god who makes such a statement is Morax, and Morax has a very, very, very long history with the water. When he first descended on Tevat, for example, a very significant portion of it was still submerged beneath the sea and the people were at the mercy of sea monsters like Baisha, as told in the primordial Jade Wing Sphere. Morax later went to Great length to terraform the land around Liwei, he raised Mount Tianheng from the bottom of the sea and lowered the tides. This infringement on their territory presumably angered the sea gods and so Morax was locked in a conflict with the sea monsters and sea gods lasting for hundreds of years. But it doesn't end here. The Gueli Assembly, Liwei's greatest civilization established by the combined forces of Hagentus, Morax, and Martosius, was later destroyed by a massive flood. Are you starting to see the significance of Tevat's struggle with water? But obviously there is a lot more to it. Remember that the Traveler fishes Paimon out of the water when they found her, and Paimon, like all the other gods on Tevat, is named after one of the 72 demons of the Ars Goetia, whom God subjugated to the king of Israel, Solomon the son of David. And Paimon in particular is one hell of a name to pick for her. <laughs> Get it? One hell, Paimon. Anyway, you know how Paimon has this infamous reputation amongst the player base for being one of the worst written characters in Genshin and an incredibly obnoxious character who actively ruins the story every time she opens her mouth? Well, I think the developers made her this way on purpose. You see, the demon known as King Paimon is described as a very beautiful young man with an effeminate face and an almost androgynous look to his features, wearing a crown with royal garbs of black and white riding a camel. He is incredibly loud and speaks in an extremely bombastic and arrogant and obnoxious tone. Right 
much exactly like our Paimon and Genshin. However, now for the spicy part. King Paimon is the closest devil to Lucifer, and one of the strongest of the 72 demons. He has so many abilities, but the ones significant to this video include his ability to fly, grant all kinds of wishes, reanimate the dead, and summon objects, and most importantly, remain underwater indefinitely. Remember this, I'll come back to it later. I want to quickly shift your attention to Bora and Mycosius, because they likely tell us a lot about Paimon. While cleansing the forbidden knowledge which Amun brought to the world, which by the way takes the form of a black liquid, Boer exhausted her strength and shrunk into a young girl. Later, during the Cataclysm, the exact same thing happened, and she ended up shrinking again into the form that resembles Nahida today, after which Rukadevata cut out the purest twig from the Ermensel and created her current incarnation, Kusanali. This is almost exactly what happened with Marcosius. When the land was tainted by corruption and the people died from disease, Marcosius exhausted much of his power to heal the land and ended up shrinking and becoming Goba. Here it is worth noting that he is shown sinking into dark waters, whether this is literal or metaphorical, it is extremely interesting. In fact, it is so interesting because get this, when the Traveler tells Paimon that she is the reason he is unlucky, Paimon claims that she never got into trouble before meeting the Traveler and that the last thing she remembers was feeling extremely exhausted and dizzy before being sucked in by a whirlpool into the sea. This is almost identical to the symptoms showcased by Boer and Marcosius, where using up their power causes them to lose their intelligence and memories and regress into childlike forms, especially with Marcosius being shown drowning underwater. And if you think that this is the big reveal I have for this video, like, oh, Pama used to be a stronger god, but then ended up using her power and became a kid like uh, Boer and Marcosius, nah, my friend, this is just the obvious part. Now, let us get into the real theory. I want you to take a notice of Paimon's chest. This symbol you see over here, very important symbol. It is the inverted tricatcher. Now, I already talked about it so many times in the previous two videos, but as a quick uh, recap, it is the symbol of unity, order, protection, and eternity. Okay, so Paimon jokingly tells the traveler that she is the god of protection, but don't let that distract you from the fact that the tricatcher on Paimon's chest is a symbol of Celestia. In fact, in Genius Invocation, the tricatcher is a symbol of the Omni Element, which is the combination of all the seven elements, and Paimon herself has two different cards, both of which can create Omni Element elemental die, and to push it even further, the Melazine Canotilla calls Paimon a rainbow balloon whose strength stretches beyond the sky itself. And finally, remember that the Tritetra is also a symbol of unity and order, and hopefully the combined 1 hour and 26 minutes from the two previous videos were enough to cement that the power of Celestia and the Abyss corresponds to order and chaos respectively. Despite being fished out of the sea by the Traveler, Paimon actually does not like water. On the contrary, just like Morax and Boer, she states that multiple times across the story she is afraid of water and scared of the deep. The only reason she is willing to dive underwater in Fontaine is due to the fact that she feels safe when the Traveler is around her. I should briefly clarify that the Omni Element and Primal Light, as discussed in the two previous videos, are distinct concepts. Primal Light represents unaligned elemental energy with the potential to become specific elements. In contrast, the Omni Element combines all the seven elements and can manifest any of their qualities consistently. In simpler terms, Primal Light is unattached elemental energy, while the Omni Element encompasses all the seven elements representing the power of Aether, Lumine, Amun, and... Uh, the Primordial One. Speaking of the Primordial One, we know that the power of the Primordial One is akin to that of the Imaginary Force, which stems from Honkai Impact's Imaginary Tree. And the Imaginary Tree is locked in an eternal battle with the Sea of Quanta, which seeks to flood. That's right, flood the tree. The Sea of Quanta possesses its own will, akin to the Abyss, which René de Petricor from Fontaine mentions in his research. In a previous video, I proposed a theory that Rhine Daughter's actions in Conria involved extracting souls from the will of the Abyss and granting them physical bodies in the human realm. This idea finds support in Elinas' account of being a formless entity drifting in the abyssal darkness before Rhine Daughter found him. The choice of the word drift implies the movement through a fluid, and since the deep sea in Genshin Impact is closely linked to the Abyss, it suggests that the Abyss may essentially be a sea of quanta, or at least inspired by it, housing certain souls like Durin and Elinas. But the Abyss would not be the only sea that contains souls within it. After all, Teyvat has the Primordial Sea, which has the capacity to dissolve certain people and absorb their consciousness and souls. Furthermore, Novella tells us that the Primordial Sea once covered the entire surface of the planet and nurtured life at its conception, which makes sense because, scientifically speaking, life on Earth very likely began in the sea. But then you have to ask, where did this Primordial Sea come from? Well, since we established previously that Primordial Waters are like a liquid form of Primal Light, and since we know that Remus had the ability to split the souls of the living and refine the Primordial Waters into Golden Ichor, it is safe to assume that the Primordial Sea comes from the 
Elemental Light Realm, which is also known as the Elemental Realm. After all, we know that after defeating the Seven Dragon Sovereigns of the Old World, the Primordial One used parts of the Light Realm to create the Human Realm. And since the Elemental Realm is where Elemental Energy originates, then the Primordial Sea likely originated from the Light Realm, kinda like a polar opposite of the Sea of Quanta or the Abyssal Sea. And from Act 2 of the Fontaine Archon Quest, we know that the souls which return to the Primordial Sea feel a sense of ease and peace, directly contrasting the sense of fear and loneliness felt by the souls drifting within the Abyss as described by Elinas. Now, it is heavily implied that the one who gave Remus his authority to refine Primordial Sea into Golden Acre was the Primordial One, who also happens to be the one that created Tevat, if you read the Tevat Genesis myth as recorded in Before Sun and Moon. The Tevat's creation myth is extremely similar to the Biblical Flood of Noah, with doves, a battle that lasts for 40 years, which in Noah's case is a flood that lasts for 40 days, and the opening of the Ark, which in this case would be the creation of Tevat, which once again means Ark. Before Sun and Moon also states that the Primordial One might have been called Fanes. It looked androgynous and had wings and a crown. And, well, let's be real here. I think everyone knows that the depiction of Fanes in both Greek mythology and Genshin is extremely similar to that of Paimon. I mean, come on, Paimon is full of celestial motifs in her design, and she has a crown, has the symbol of the Omni element on her chest, indicating that she controls the seven elements, and the starry cape on her back heavily resembles a wing. At least half a pair of wings. Perhaps the other one was broken? Also, this early official art of Paimon shows her holding a staff akin to that of the Greek Fanes, so, uh... Paimon is the primordial one, right? No, she's not. In the world of Tevat, there is a reoccurring seven-day cycle of destruction, where the land is submerged, possibly through flooding. To maintain this illusion, the gods likely covered Tevat with a false sky. This false sky is crucial because in a repeating cycle, everything restarts from scratch, but the real stars in the sky change independently of Tevat. Therefore, the true sky represents an uncontrollable variable symbolizing constant change and unpredictability. Now, for those of you who watched my video on the inspirations of quantum mechanics in the Hoyoverse, what I just said should ring some bells, because if you are Celeste, and your goal is to lock the world in a loop, one of your major priorities would be hiding the true stars with a false sky in order to prevent any potential for your subjects to figure out the true nature of their world using the ever-changing sky. The false sky's purpose is to prevent change, locking people into a predetermined destiny written amongst the stars. It's a cruel, unchanging fate, devoid of hope and true potential. Ermin's soul serves to maintain these divine illusions, and now Zandik's main goal becomes burning Ermin's soul in order to destroy the false sky because the Fatui's true plan is to create a new supreme deity to challenge the Abyss and the Primordial One. And to rally the people behind this new god, absolute compliance can only be achieved by revealing the truth. And this brings me all the way back to the Primordial One. Although Paimon and Fanes have a lot in common when it comes to their designs and characteristics, Paimon still cannot be the Primordial One, because as absurd as this might sound, Fanes is unlikely to be the Primordial One. For evidence of what I say, look no further than Before Sun and Moon. There, the scribe of Istaroth writes that the Primordial One may have been Fanes, indicating that the author of the records was not sure of the true identity of the Primordial One. Remember that Fanes in Greek mythology was the son of the Primordial Kronos and Ananke, who are often depicted in the shape of a serpent representing time and fate. Now, serpents are extremely important animals in the mythologies and theologies that inspire Genshin Impact. Heck, even the Genshin Battle Pass, the Genesis Pearl which the crowned heir seeks is depicted with a snake wrapped around it, while Fanes himself is often shown with a snake wrapped around him protecting an egg. In Genshin Impact, this would likely be the Cosmic Egg or the Genesis Pearl. But after all that I said, how is Fanes not the primordial one? Well, you see, the scribe of Istaroth writes that following the defeat of the dragons, the Primordial One took one of its four shades and they went on to create the world and shape the world of Tevat. However, we do not know what the other three shades were doing. But hold on a second. We have the Primordial One who went along with one of its shades to create the world. Three shades are unmentioned. What a coincidence! Tevat once had three moon sisters who governed destiny. However, I need to make it clear that the Moon Sisters might have been independent from the Four Shades, but at the end of the day, whether the Three Moon Sisters were a part of the Four Shades or not does not change what I'm about to say that much. But for the purposes of this video, let us assume that the Three Moon Sisters were also three out of the Four Shades of the Primordial One. And if we do so, then suddenly the Primordial One taking one of its Four Shades to create the world becomes way more significant, because Fanes in Greek mythology is a god of light and creation, and he is the son of Ananke, who is also the mother of the Morai, the three fates who govern destiny, meaning that they are the sisters 
of fanes, not his daughters. And if the Moon Sisters are three of the four shades, then logically the sun, which is the ultimate source of light and life in the world, would then be the fourth shade, who is none other than fanes. The shade who went with the primordial one to create the world of Teyvat. And this is extremely important because if fanes and the Moon Sisters are of the four shades of the primordial one, this means that the true identity of the primordial one would then be either Kronos or Ananke, or better yet, both at the same time. Because remember, in Greek mythology, Ananke is the mother of Fanes, the snake wrapped around him, and she is also the mother of the three fates. Now, if this turns out to be true, then suddenly this explains the name of the book that records the tales of the primordial one, Before Sun and Moon. Although the title might fool you into thinking that the author is referring to the Dainichi Mikoshi, in reality they are talking about the four shades of the primordial one, the Sun, Fanes, and his three lunar sisters. Now, since we are on the topic of fate and destiny, don't you notice how everything that Paimon does seems to be a little scripted? Perhaps even a little too scripted? You see, ever since we met Paimon, she has always been the one who moves us along, takes us from one location to another, and makes sure to take up most of the conversations we have with people. Almost as if she is dragging us along her through a predetermined path. And whenever we try to stray too far from that path, it is always Paimon who pops up and tells us... <laughs> And this is completely unnecessary. The developers could have easily just reset our position whenever we try to exit the current boundaries of the game. But instead, it is always Spymon who pops up and makes sure that we remain within a certain given location at any point in time, making sure that we go to specific places, do specific actions, and meet specific People! When we meet the Aranara and Sumeru, they heavily associate Paimon with the color silver. And as we know, silver is the traditional color of the moon. Better yet, when we talk to Arama, he directly tells us that Paimon is like a moon. And if you have been watching all the way up till now, congratulations! It's about to get real good. Suddenly, all of the random encounters and occurrences that happen in the story of Genshin no longer appear to be random at all. They all have their purpose because everything we do and every path we walk is all a part of of a predetermined destiny, a predetermined fate that Paimon is trying to reach, and whether she knows it or not, she is dragging the traveler alongside her since they are an outsider, just like the stars, an uncontrollable variable beyond the grasp of Celestia. And even if this entire video is wrong, never mind, even if this entire trilogy is wrong, I can still look you in the eye and tell you with absolute certainty. Paimon is almost definitely, nay, Paimon is definitely one of the Moon Sisters, one of the five supreme divinities of Tevat. This means that one of the reasons why Paimon dislikes water is because through hydromancy, water can be used to decipher the fate of Teyvat. We know this thanks to Mona, who herself is the disciple of the Hexen Zirkle witch, Barbellet. But make no mistake, although Paimon is dictating our fate, whether intentionally or subconsciously, I still do not think that she is truly evil or malevolent. You see, despite being extremely unlikable and incredibly annoying and obnoxious, Paimon is genuinely good of heart. She really loves the people of Teyvat and cares for their struggles and suffering. In fact, most of the time, the Traveler does not even care or bother to help most people. Remember that Paimon is almost always the one who begs the Traveler to assist people in need. And even if Paimon lost her memories, such a virtuous will does not come out of nothing. It is something that is ingrained within one's fundamental nature. So yes, Paimon is almost definitely a good person. But where does this leave us? Okay, I don't want to waste your time. I think most of you already realize that the Kingdom of Cambria is heavily influenced by a story by Richard Wagner where a dwarf named Albrecht steals a golden treasure from the three Rhine Maidens and fashions it into a great magical ring. Do keep in mind that the house of Albrecht is Kaya's family and that the last King of Cambria was an Albrecht himself. Hence, the three Rhine Maidens most likely refer to the Moon Sisters, which by the way could mean that Rhine Daughter is a Seelie since the Seelies worship the Moon Sisters. But anyway, back to the main point. If we combine all of the details I discussed in this video, we can create a very rudimentary outline of what happened to Paimon. First, we know that Paimon is a good god. She is very likely one of the Moon Sisters, and the Moon Sisters are also likely to be three out of the four shades. So we have Paimon, Istaroth, Fanes, a third unknown Moon Sister, and the Primordial One. This gives us five supreme divinities in Celestia, and here I want to redirect your attention to the biblical flood stories of Noah and Utnapishtim. And remember that in the Mesopotamian myth of Utnapishtim, there were five who decided to destroy the world. 
in Lil, Anu, Ninurta, Inugi, and Ea. But one of those five gods, Ea, felt pity for the humans and decided to warn Utnapishtim of the ensuing calamity. So if we translate that into Genshin, the world of Teyvat is locked into the seven-day cycle of destruction. We have five supreme divinities. Those would be the primordial one and its four shades. So at some point in time, likely before the fall of the Moon Sisters, one of the gods, Paimon, took pity upon humanity and felt regret for what the gods will do. Now we have all the components of a biblical flood. We've got a large body of water, which is either the abyss or the primordial sea. We have an angry divinity that seeks to punish the arrogations of mankind. We have an ark, Tevat, but we are still missing one vital component to our story, the flood hero. If Paimon felt pity upon humans, then who could be her chosen hero? Who could be Genshin's equivalent of Noah and Utnapishtim? Well, this is where things get a little tricky here because we have to remember that the Moon Sisters were first and foremost gods of destiny and fate, and if Istaroth was anything to go by, they were also gods of time. So we are going to have to think just a little bit outside of the box here. That being said, I lied to you this entire video. Or rather I should say, I did not divulge the full truth. The word Tevat does not only mean ark or ship, it also has a different meaning, chest, as in treasure chest. And this doesn't sound too impressive until you realize that the Ars Goetia demon King Paimon is obsessed with treasure and gold and can summon all manners of treasures and jewelry for his master. Now recall the story about the dwarf Albrecht who stole a golden treasure from the Rhine Maidens and fashioned it into a magical ring. Well, that ring is likely a reference to Solomon's holy seal, given to him by God to subjugate the devils of the Ars Goetia. However, aside from Albrecht, there is one other man who during the cataclysm of Kanria came out of the Tunigi Hollow clutching a ring tightly to his chest. A masked blonde swordsman who also happens to be immortal. I think I have a pretty solid candidate for who Paimon's hero could potentially be. My memory has all but faded completely, but I will always remember how much she too loved these flowers. Okay, you have successfully reached the end of this video, and this is the outro. Well done, I'm proud of you. I want to take this opportunity to make a few notes and clarifications. Obviously, do keep in mind that a lot of the things I uh, talk about are speculations based on evidence we have so far in game. At the end of the day, some of the characters I talk about in this video might simply be characters that we have not met yet in the story, meaning that there is no possible way for us to know whether they exist or not. Now, some of you might be wondering, if Paimon is such an important deity, then why does no one in Teyvat, including the Archons, recognize her? That is a valid question. And there are three possibilities here. One option is that Paimon could control how people think and thus force them into accepting her without questioning. Another alternative, and this is the one that I personally believe the most, is that the Archons do recognize Paimon, but simply keep their mouths shut because it was part of their contract with her. If Paimon is indeed following a certain destiny that she wrote for herself when she was a true god, then she likely rallied the Archons around her and contracted them not to inform her future self of what happened in the past to prevent such information from altering fate. And the third option is that Paimon is simply a product of Istaroth because we fish her near the Thousand Winds. However, I do not think this theory is solid, and we would need to know if Boar had a different demon name when she was Rukka Devata before we can assume that Paimon is Istaroth. But Paimon could also be Istaroth's daughter, just like Barbados. That's an option. Finally, this theory is fundamentally rooted in the assumption that before Sun and Moon is accurate, because remember that the author of the book simply assumes that the Primordial One won the war against the Second Who Came, without being able to actually verify his claims. Therefore, if the Second Who Came was indeed victorious in the war and manages to kill or drive away the Primordial One, then not only is this theory wrong, but almost everything we know in Teyvat is probably also a lie. So we have to take things with a grain of salt and assume that the Second Who Came is not the current controller of Tevat. But for now, that is it for me. Thank you all for watching and take care.